Thanks everyone for joining. We'll be starting in about one minute. Okay, thank you everyone for joining the July edition of our monthly analyst call. We are joined by the Kaiko Research Team. My name is Clara, Director of Research, and we here have Desi and Riyadh. Um, and today we're here to talk about altcoins. So it's been quite an active past few weeks in the cryptocurrency industry. A ton has happened, but specifically looking at the altcoin sector. Um, and it started a few months ago when you had the regulators started filing lawsuits, um, essentially naming a lot of altcoins and alleging that they were unlicensed securities offering. So there's been a lot of bearish, um, some bearish headwinds for altcoin markets, which sort of all disappeared last week when you had the Ripple versus SEC ruling, um, which caused a lot of excitement in cryptocurrency markets, and we'll talk a lot about the impact of this ruling on altcoins. Um, but then this week, we've had three new cryptocurrencies launch just in the past week. Um, you've had WorldCoin, which launched yesterday. You have a new decentralized stablecoin from Aave. Um, and then you also have Arkham, which launched their own native token. So again, a lot is happening in the crypto space, specifically at altcoins. And today we're going to focus on global trends in liquidity while looking at a few specific examples of what's been going on. So before I get started a bit, uh, Kaiko, in case you are new here, Kaiko is a crypto data provider. We were founded in 2014. Today, we have four main business units. The first is our market data offering. This is tick level and aggregated data for more than 100 centralized and decentralized exchanges. The second is our BMR compliant rates and indices for investable financial products. The third is our quantitative analytics for pricing and assessing risk. And then fourth is our research. Um, this is all powered by Kaiko. So in case you haven't yet seen, Kaiko Research recently launched a new website. You can now find all of our offerings at research.kaiko.com. I sent the link in the chat, but you'll find all insights, reports, and recordings of previous analyst calls. Um, and in case you are unfamiliar, we have two newsletters sent on Monday and Thursday, a quarterly report, a weekly chart book, and then this analyst call, which you're all here for today. So before we get going, research is all powered by Kaiko's expansive data offerings. Today, we cover more than 100 centralized exchanges and DeFi protocols, encompassing dozens of individual data types. This is everything from derivatives markets to order book data to tick level trades. And then on the DeFi side, we look at liquidity pools, snapshot data, tick level events, and lending protocols. So everything you hear, you see today is actually available through Kaiko's data services. So to get started, I'm going to present global trends and altcoin liquidity. The first chart I'm going to show is altcoin trade volume. So this is essentially looking at all crypto assets that are not Bitcoin. There are thousands and thousands of traded assets tra trading on the exchanges in Kaiko's coverage. And this data here aggregates the top 25 exchanges. We can see here that ever since the March banking crisis in regulatory crackdown, which started in about April, we've seen a big reduction in altcoin trade volume. Um, Today, volumes are about one third of what they were during Q1. And in fact, Q2 volumes were some of the lowest over the past few years. Um, but what's interesting is then you had the Ripple ruling. The Ripple ruling caused a slight spike in volume, and it actually caused prices to surge for quite a few altcoins. But what's interesting is that volumes relatively were actually quite stable over the past few months, and we actually didn't see that large an impact, which does suggest that there's still a ways to go before we reach previous bull market levels. And it, especially considering if we zoom out a bit, here we're looking at the same data type, but this time going back to 2019, we can see quite an interesting trend. Altcoin trade volumes overall has fallen quite a lot since the bull market of 2021. 
The good news is that it's still a lot higher than 2019 and 2020, but overall it's still relatively low. And because we're entering the summer months when tr trade volume tends to fall, we could expect continued suppressed volume until the fall. But again, all this volume is relative. And I think we noticed an interesting trend when we're comparing Bitcoin trade volume, which is pretty much the most powerful gauge for interest in crypto markets. We noticed that the ratio of Bitcoin trade volume to altcoin trade volume has fallen quite a bit. So historically speaking, every time this ratio falls, it typically sort of predates uh, a mini bull run. This is because during a bull market, altcoins are have some of the highest returns and you see some of the most excitement for traders, specifically in altcoins. So you see this rotation of funds from Bitcoin markets into altcoin markets. And in fact, since the start of the year, Bitcoin volume dominance was about 45%. And today it's just 27%. And the big shift happened over the past few weeks, ever since you had the Ripple ruling. So an interesting question I had is, is this trend the same on US exchanges relative to offshore exchanges? So we, we have a pretty interesting divergence on US exchanges. We can see that Bitcoin, the ratio of Bitcoin to altcoin volume has stayed relatively flat since the start of the year. It did spike to almost 50% during the mini Bitcoin bull run right after uh, around April and May. But since then, it is now at about 30%. But when we look at offshore exchanges, we notice a pretty interesting trend. That is the complete sort of collapse of Bitcoin trade volumes relative to altcoin. At the start of the year, 46% of all trades on these offshore exchanges were for Bitcoin, whereas today only 26% of these trades are. This means that the majority of people trading on offshore exchanges today are trading altcoins. And what's even more interesting is if we want to understand who is trading these altcoins where, we noticed a trend, and that is on Korean cryptocurrency exchanges, they have a very relatively high ratio of altcoin volume. Here we are looking at the top two Korean exchanges, these are Upbit and Bithum, that collectively have 25% market share of altcoin volume relative to 23 other exchanges. These are all other exchanges, both US and offshore. So this is just to show that Korean markets have a huge impact on the overall altcoin space, um, and especially over the past few weeks. So what are people trading? In 2023, I ranked the top 10 traded altcoins by trade volume, looking at the same selection of exchanges. And we can see that by and large, XRP has been the top traded asset by nearly uh, 100%. It's, it's way more than the next nearest asset. Um, and Desi is going to explain a bit more about what's happening with the Ripple and XRP ruling in the next section. But this is just to show that traders are really going all in for XRP right now. The next two is Sol and Doge, which is a meme coin. And then you have BNB and Matic. And so the final metric I'm going to look at is liquidity data. Essentially, what market depth looks at is the quantity of all bids and asks on order books for these assets. Kaiko has some of the most comprehensive order book data in the industry. We essentially are collecting all order books from every single traded market on every single exchange in our coverage. So what we want to look at altcoin market depth. What we're doing essentially is taking the top 10 altcoins and we're essentially aggregating all information from every single traded instrument um, that has this altcoin included in the base asset. So we take the sum of liquidity across all of these markets and it's dozens and dozens and dozens to get an idea of global altcoin liquidity. And here we can see that overall Bitcoin market depth is still about $100 million higher than the aggregated market depth for the top 10 altcoins. So Bitcoin by and large is still the most liquid asset, but altcoins have seen a slight increase over the past month. This is in large part due to the Ripple ruling. The ruling caused a big spike in prices. So we're actually seeing the impact of the increase in prices for these altcoins, um, which uh, because overall the actual quantity of these assets supplied to order books has not changed that much over the past few months. Um, and in fact, when we zoom out a bit, here we're looking at the exact same data type, but this time we're going to uh, pre-FTX collapse, which happened in November. And we can see that liquidity collapsed sort of overall on both Bitcoin markets and altcoin markets, and it still has not yet recovered. Bitcoin saw the sharpest drop in market depth, whereas altcoin markets, it about it, it halved a bit. Um, but 
despite the fact that we've seen a slight recovery, there's still a long way to go. So I think this is to show that just because we're seeing prices increase does not mean liquidity as measured by both market depth and volume. We're still a long way to go. Um, and also, by the way, you can ask questions in the chat and we'll have some time for Q&A later. So next I will introduce Desi, who is going to talk about the specific catalysts impacting um, altcoin markets now. So I'm going to talk about uh, two market events which impacted altcoins this month. First is, of course, the XP XRP ruling, and then the second one is Celsius. Celsius gained approval from the court to start liquidating its altcoin holdings into Bitcoin and Ethereum, and we are going to uh, look into liquidity of their holdings. So the first chart shows uh, uh, XRP trade volume and price. Uh, what we see is that uh, the market uh, saw the ripple ruling as a very positive news, volumes is increased, um, exceeding 5 billion, exceeding Bitcoin average daily trade volume in Q2. However, historically, we have the, we have the same uh, trend as we have in altcoins. It is lower than we had, uh, what we had in 2020, 2021. Prices, however, have remained, uh, have increased by more than 50% this month and remain pretty high. So where is XRP traded? This is the next chart. Um, these are the cumulative trade volumes of XRP since 2021, since the, basically the lawsuit started. And what we essentially see is that uh, after several U.S. exchanges delisted XRP, uh, trading has been largely offshore. The main market for, the, for XRP is Binance and Korean markets. We have Coinbase and Kraken uh, that relisted XRP right after the ruling. Uh, and we have seen um, pretty strong buying on U.S. exchanges. This is the next chart, which essentially shows um, the buy and sell and sell volumes of Coinbase, Binance, Kraken, and Upbit. And what we see is that a lot of the increase in trade volume was actually positioning of US investors, which uh, who gained access to XRP after two years. Uh, buying was almost 70% um, um, of overall trade volumes of Coinbase. It has declined since. And then the interesting thing is that uh, we, seen, we have seen over the past few days some buying on a bit which has taken over and looking at the old sites it's both retail traders and uh, whales that were buying you want using my computer i think there's some microphone issues already yes good thing we are in the same room so desi's gonna take over here So, um, as I was saying, we had some pretty strong buying from U.S. investors and uh, positioning from uh, from traders that started buying Ripple after it was re released on Coinbase. And then over the past few days, we had also some increased buying pressure on a bit. So, Korean traders have taken over. Uh, the next chart shows... Um, Uh, shows uh, a Bitcoin open interest, um, XRP open interest, and altcoins open interest. We see that XRP saw pretty robust um, capital inflows. Open interest for perpetual futures is up 70% this month. Um, altcoins, um, this is the aggregate open interest for um, uh, the altcoins which were named as securities in both the Coinbase and Binance law suite. Uh, have also seen inflows, but uh, when we break this down by asset, it is actually pretty uneven. We saw an increase for Solana, for uh, Cardano Sada, for Matic, but other altcoins such as Axie and, and Algorand saw uh, in outflows. So uh, it has been pretty uneven. Uh, and then we can move to Celsius. So Celsius has been under Chapter 11. They have been restructuring and this month gained approval from the court to start uh, converting their altcoin holdings into Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, this is a chart from our liquidity ranking, which we presented last month. And uh, for those of you who are not present, we are uh, ranking the 30 largest uh, crypto assets, excluding uh, stable coins and wrapped assets uh, using uh, different liquidity metrics, uh, market debt volumes and spreads. And then we compare this with market cap. This is what the chart is showing. Sometimes there is a big divergence. And uh, we looked at the, what, uh, what the, uh, the liquidity ranking of Celsius holdings. What we essentially see is that they do hold 
a mixed bag of liquid and illiquid altcoins, some of them such as BNB, uh, Cardano, Sada, Solana are pretty liquid, others are not that liquid, and some of them are not ranked in our uh, liquidity ranking because they're very liquid. So all, all in all, um, more than half of the holdings are poorly ranked or not very liquid, which means that uh, selling them could be challenging. Um, so next, looking only at market debt, this is the market debt of the, of the holdings uh, on centralized exchanges. Uh, what we essentially see is that it has, it has declined. It has been pretty impacted by the collapse of FTX, and it has declined by 50% uh, from 200 million to around 100 million. It has not recovered since. And then the second important thing is that most of it is actually on offshore exchanges. We don't really know what uh, would be the execution venues or at what rate they're going to sell, but uh, should they decide to focus on the US exchanges, it, it could be quite difficult to sell these uh, holdings. So the last chart shows uh, Celsius nat native token, which they also hold on their balance sheet, and they hold around uh, 200 million of Celsius. So uh, looking at uh, its market debt, it has been declining pretty dramatically from more than um, 150,000 to just 30,000. Uh, and it is only on two exchanges, OKX and Buy, uh, Bybit. So essentially selling this token would be very, very difficult. Uh, and with this, I'm going to pass the floor to Riyadh, who is going to talk about state liquidity. Thanks, Desi. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to first actually uh, start with the WorldCoin launch. Um, and then go to staked ETH liquidity. Um, so yeah, the world coin launch was obviously pretty hyped, uh, pretty controversial, um, but we'll just look at it on a pure markets uh, level. Um, so we can see here that it's been listed on about uh, like five, five instruments, or there have been about five instruments listed so far on about like four or five exchanges. Um, but I think what's really interesting is how quickly the price converged um, in the past with these uh, huge hyped token launches. Uh, we've seen some messiness at the beginning with huge uh, price divergences um, across exchanges and even within exchanges, uh, like on an instrument by instrument level. Um, so you can see here that Bybit was one of the first to list. Um, didn't have too many huge divergences. Um, Huobi was also early to list. Um, and you can see that it did have at the bottom left some sort of weird, very cheap trades. Um, it's not totally clear what happened there, but um, sort of anecdotally, we have noticed that Huobi seems to have issues with these kinds of launches, uh, that it often has like these really strange price action uh, very early on. Um, and then by the time that Binance joined the fray, um, like a couple hours after Bybit had listed the pair, um, the price was pretty stable um, in terms of all converging around the same level. Um, so it looks like these, you know, this kind of launch sort of shows that maybe they had learned some of the lessons of earlier launches that were very scattered um, and sort of messy, um, leading to a lot of uh, chances for arbitrage and things like that. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, we can see why this happened. Um, this was a really uh, unusual launch in that only uh, about 140 million tokens were released. 100 million of these tokens went to market makers. Um, so it's, it's sort of interestingly just like a hugely, um, skewed towards mark maker kind of launch and I, I don't know maybe in the chat you can uh let me know if i'm forgetting anything but I, I really can't remember a launch that was this heavily geared towards market makers um and worldcoin was pretty upfront in their tokenomics paper um which if you're in the us you have to use a vpn to read um but yeah saying 100 million of the 140 million of the initial launch went to market makers um which is pretty interesting. And that's why we had such large trades. I, I saw some people on Twitter were sort of confused as to why that was happening, uh, given that the allocations to people were very small. Um, and then I, I guess it, it is important to note that the 140 million is really just a drop in the bucket of the eventual 
10 billion uh, final supply. And then there's also a potential 1.5% inflation per year on top of that. So these are really just very, very small amount of tokens that have been released. I've seen some comparisons to like the Solana projects that were, you know, had some predatory VCs like uh, Alameda Research um, that used kind of similar mechanics where they had really small um, initial supply with like massive inflation um, that allowed sort of the, you know, those VCs like Alameda to, to dump their tokens on retail users. Um, I don't know. This is, this is a pretty unique one. So we'll have to see what happens. Um, but it is, it is a bit strange. Um, next we'll move on to something that, um, I discussed last time, but I think is worth, uh, discussing again, uh, just because of how important I think it is. Um, and that is staked ETH's success. And then also the sort of the risk that I see building up, um, so you can see that supply since uh, April has really shot up. Um, it was under 6 million at the start of April. It's about 8 million now. The number of holders on Ethereum has also increased. Um, there, there are about 50,000 new holders since the start of April. So everything seems to be going well. But um, the, the I'll move on now to the risk that I see here. Um, in, in the form of uh, liquidity. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, oh, there we go. Um, the curve uh, staked ETH, ETH pool has always been by far the most important venue for staked ETH liquidity. Um, and since Chappella, it has lost about 750,000 uh, ETH and staked ETH tokens. Um, in that time, the TVL has dropped from about 2 billion to like 500 million. Um, it used to be by far the largest pool on Curve, and now it's will probably be the second largest in the next couple weeks, um, which is uh, pretty strange. Um, and all of this has been um, accelerated in July. Uh, you can see that that last large drop. Um, as we moved into July, um, this is because uh, for the first month um, ever, the Lido DAO removed the Lido token incentives for this pool, um, which are hugely important for incentivizing liquidity um, as essentially to provide liquidity in this pool. You're essentially forgoing half of your staked ETH yield. Um, in return, you're getting trading fees, which do not make up for that yield, and the Lido incentives, which in the past had made up for that lost yield, but no longer are. And so, you know, in the governance form, I've, I've seen that when this, uh, the, this was announced, um, the team basically said, well, look, the withdrawals are open now. So, you know, we have a new form of liquidity in just being able to deposit and withdraw tokens. I think that that's a mistake, but I'll come back to that um, after the next slide. Um, where you can see a, a zoomed in example. Uh, this is from July 13th. This is a wallet uh, tagged as Nexo, the uh, crypto lender, uh, kind of centralized lending protocol. Um, and we can see that they removed um, about 80,000 ETH and staked ETH in 19 transactions in under 30 minutes. Um, so, you know, this is just sort of an example of what it looks like when a, when a big holder um, decides that, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to uh, provide liquidity in a pool anymore. Um, so I, I would expect that this will continue. Uh, there's no sign that, you know, it'll become economically rational to provide liquidity in this pool um, later. Um, and just circling back to why I think that this is a mistake from the DAO, um, yes, withdrawals are open, but in the case of a big market event where a lot of people are trying to withdraw, it's very possible and like highly likely that 
the uh, queue would extend for hours, days, possibly longer than that. Um, and in that situation, people would probably opt to swap their staked ETH for ETH. And, you know, if there's not a lot of liquidity in this curve pool, um, there's not a lot of liquidity on centralized exchanges, which I covered in the last call. Um, and beyond curve, there's not a lot of liquidity on chain either. I think it's pretty possible that we could see, um, you know, the staked ETH discount uh, increase pretty significantly. And given how ingrained in DeFi staked ETH has become, um, I think that this is pretty concerning. Um, there's a lot of leverage on lending and borrowing protocols with staked ETH. And I think a lot of people assuming that staked ETH will trade, you know, at even with ETH for the foreseeable future. I think that's a pretty risky assumption. Um, I'm sort of surprised that more lending and borrowing protocols haven't, you know, uh, noticed this risk and, and taken action to, uh, you know, sort of mitigate it. But um, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, I, I think it actually kind of ties around to the world coin thing and that they engage with the market maker and it seemed to work pretty well for them. Um, I don't know if that's, you know, something that will come in the pipe for Lido DAO, but uh, I think it's something worth considering for sure. Um, and yeah, I guess we can move on to Q and A. Great, thank you, Riyadh. Sorry about the technical issues earlier, but I think we got some great analyses in looking at altcoins. If you have any questions, you can now ask them um, in the chat or in the questions tab. Um, so I see we have one. First, uh, looking at staked ETH, do you think the re regulatory implication of Coinbase CB ETH um, getting closed in 10 states? So yeah, that's actually a really good question. I'll let Riyadh answer that about what could possibly happen with CB ETH. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough to say. I think staked ETH is probably a bit more resilient to these kind of regulatory issues. Um, I thought CB ETH was like a nice... Uh, I, I tend to think that it's good to have a lot of options here, although that does fragment liquidity. Um, so we'll see sort of how that affects liquidity um, on-chain, or sorry, off-chain as well. Um, but I'll have to look into that more and... and uh, Maybe I'll discuss that in the next call. I think that'd be interesting. Great. And if there are not any more questions, then I just sent the link for our next. Oh, we do have one more question. Okay. First off, though, I sent a link for our next analyst call happening, I think, the second week of September. We're taking a one month break during summer. Um, okay. One question is Are there concerns regarding staked ETH liquidity? Um, yeah, with the uh, LSD narrative. Yeah, I mean, that that's sort of what is concerning to me is that I've seen more protocols that are essentially treating staked ETH the same as ETH. And I really just want to emphasize that that's not true. And, um, you know, I, I think that that will come back to bite some people um, for sure. But I, on the whole, I do think that liquid staking derivatives are positive and, and definitely a good development, but I think they just need to be really thoughtful about how they manage liquidity. Okay. I think we had one question up, Krithan. Um, So that's a question on volume. So the volume we showed was, was trade volume on exchanges. So we just collected, Kaiko collects all tick level transaction data, buy and sell data um, for spot markets. So this was only looking at spot volume, not derivatives volume. Um, and ultimately there, ever since the FTX collapse, there was a big drop in spot volume for both Bitcoin and altcoins. Um, okay, we have another question from Denzel. Again, this is this is towards Riyadh. So Riyadh, I will let you take it. Yeah. On. Yeah, I think that the the price, I would say more the price convergence rather than the stability was really the, the benefit here. Um, I, you know, I saw some people speculating that they wanted to hold it at a particular price level. I, I can't really speak to that um, speculation, um, you know, because, you know, who knows what those, those contracts look like. Um, but 
it does seem like they learned the lesson from previous ones where we saw like you know a bunch of tokens were getting airdropped on ethereum and then it was getting clogged as people tried to like withdraw the tokens to exchanges there's a huge like backup on the network um so I, i think it was sort of smart in that sense but again it's such a small supply relative to the eventual total supply it's like it is a little bit strange um oh and i, I see the there's also the staking entry queue question um I, i guess i don't have a particular view on like whether the queue will get longer or shorter but i do think that you know people are sort of assuming that it is like a functioning a, a, a well functioning sort of liquidity venue which i don't think it should be treated as that because of the queue because the the um entries and exits are not instantaneous and they can sort of extend over a period of time um so i, I think it is a little bit risky to just rely on withdrawals from uh native staking Yeah, and on the market maker side, I think pretty much every crypto asset has market makers. Um, not only that, especially new crypto tokens and less liquid ones always will hire a market maker because otherwise your risk at being delisted from an exchange because an exchange is not going to offer an illiquid trading pair to their users. Um, so they're just going to delist the token if there are not market makers for it. Okay. All right, I see we have one person typing, so we'll wait a few seconds. Oh yeah, the around the the exit queue being short. Yeah, I mean I I think some folks like uh I think 21 shares has a really good um like estimator where you can say like if I wanted to withdraw this much how long would it take? Um I think that's pretty interesting and sort of uh is part of the reason I'm a little bit Uh, concerned about relying on that alone. So. Okay, thank you everyone and thanks for all your really engaging questions. Um we we appreciate anything. Email us if you have any suggestions for coverage you want and otherwise you can subscribe to our newsletters. So see you next call in September. Thanks all. Bye.